Hey, this is Rob Worman from ERCast, and I'm standing with Dr. Mike Schertz. Who is this guy? You might know him, you might not know him. Mike runs a company called Crisis Medicine, and I actually subscribe to Crisis Medicine because they teach me something that I've never learned anywhere else. They teach, well, they teach me, but they teach how to respond to a crisis situation where there will be casualties. And this day and age, that's usually gonna be some kind of penetrating trauma, that's gonna be some kind of explosive shrapnel trauma, where there are going to be many casualties who are bleeding to death very quickly. How do you take care of that? Why do people die? How do I save them immediately? All different levels of training. But the reason that we're doing this video today because I was watching one of Mike's videos on how to put on a tourniquet. I'm thinking, oh yeah, oh yeah. And he's actually reviewing these different tourniquets. And so I'm thinking, oh yeah, tourniquet this, tourniquet that. And I realized I've never put on a tourniquet in my life. Now Mike has. Mike's an emergency physician. He runs tactical medicine programs. He's an EMS director. He was a special forces combat medic for 13 years. So he knows tourniquets. So what we're going to do is I'm actually, I've, we did not rehearse this, clearly, and I'm gonna try to put on a tourniquet, and I don't know if I'll get it, I don't know what's gonna happen, and then Mike's gonna show me all the ways that I effed it up and how to do it right. The clock's ticking. This young man has just come in, either to the emergency department or he's lying on the ground, and I've got a tourniquet right here. This is about how they would come. That's a, that's a Generation 7 uh, cat tourniquet from North American Rescue. Represents about 75% of the tourniquets in the DOD inventory and certainly the most common among law enforcement and uh, the fire services in our area. All right, so I'm going to open this thing here. Let's see what we got. I'm clearly not going to read the directions because now he's got a stump and is bleeding like crazy. So what I have here is I've got a stick and it's on some webbing. And then I've got the tourniquet itself. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it up. Let's see, I'm gonna put it on your arm right here. Okay, so I know I need to turn this stick at some point, so let's see, how do I make it tight? All right, so I got a strap right there. I'm gonna pull the strap snug. All right, come around here. And I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know what this does, but I'm gonna put this thing in there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap that around there. Now I'm gonna twist this thing. Oh wait, maybe that goes in there. I'm gonna pull that out of there. Have you died yet? Are you close? I'm, I'm probably still. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna twist we'll this thing. Another 60 seconds. Let me know when it twists tight enough. Twist it more. No, don't tell me. All right, I'm gonna twist it some more. Let me see if I can feel a pulse. No pulse. No, you do have a pulse. All right, I'm gonna twist it a little bit more. Damn, that's tight. Okay. Done. How'd it go? All right, you're happy? I'm happy. All right, so let's, uh, let's kind of work backwards. So right now, this windlass, this twist stick is in these little brackets here, so that's gonna be secure. Is that what they're for? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it's for. Uh, finesse point is to put this over the top, but then you really need to take this little Velcro retaining band to trap all of this, this windlass in place. Reason being is right now the only thing that's holding this tight is this twist stick yeah. and this Velcro. So if this kicks out for some reason, you've completely lost all occlusion. Uh, and that's actually unfortunately happened in Afghanistan and individuals have died. So once it's twisted in play, twisted, you really need to lock it in place. And then the final step there, ideally, is to cover it. Although with okay, the so arm, so this so this guy is just a reinforcing band in case that correct pops out. It's exactly what's okay, for. and it kind it kind of keeps it in there. Yeah, yeah. Let me make it a little bit tighter here, a snugger. Okay. And on an arm where you have this extra tail, it is a good idea to trap that in there as well. On a thigh, you won't have that much extra. Okay, so this, and this just dangles? Yeah, unfortunately, there's no real way to secure that. Okay. okay. There's no other Velcro. But again, that'll make it less likely that this entire thing is gonna release because the only thing holding it on the limb is the Velcro. All right. Now we're gonna have someone who actually knows what they're doing put this on, just talk us through as you go. And then, sure. once, and then once it goes on and we see how many twists you do, 
I'm going to put the Doppler on and we'll see what, see what, the, uh, what the pulse does sure. as the pressure increases. All right. So I've had, well, let's say I'm cut off, <laughs> I'm cut off down here. Okay. I'm bleeding out. What do we do? All right. So the first thing is we need to get this tourniquet on his limb. Now, he's wearing a short sleeve shirt, so I can see all the limb holes, but we're going to assume that it's a long sleeve shirt, high risk environment. Now, wait a second. You, now, you just, so I went down here right. on your mid arm. Correct. You, you're like way up in my axilla. Right. I'm going physically as high on his limb as possible because I don't want there to be penetrating wounds above where I put the tourniquet that I didn't see. Okay. The one that's bleeding the most is only the one that's bleeding until I tourniquet you, and then maybe blood starts coming out of the wound above or proximal to the tourniquet. Okay. Yeah, and when you put it, and it wasn't just you put it there, I felt you snug it. Correct. Into it. One of the idiosyncrasies with these devices is as soon as they're on, you need to pull as much of the slack out as possible. So they have to be pretty much venous constricting bad. You can see his big old manly veins that are sticking up on his biceps. So it's already pretty snug. And then how did you pull the slack out? So okay. because it's just friction. Okay. Just pull it down on itself. And then I was like, do that one more time. So you, you had it, so it's, so it's loose and this, that band is just loose. So you undo the Velcro and then just pull, pull it, it around on itself and then trap all the Velcro down. Okay. Then the next step is going to be to twist this. Let's see, let's, un let's, okay. un let's loosen, unloosen here. Yeah, you're loose. So we're going to have the Doppler on. Let's get our pulse. 1 twist. Two twist. Three twist. No pulse. Now, although he's completely occluded at this point, let's let go ahead. Go put it back on. That so was, ninety uh, degrees here makes a difference. So to be honest, I would probably give him one more. I can't say that that feels great. Then it's tr it, we click it in place. We wrap all the tail over the top, secure the Velcro retaining band, and that's a properly applied. So it's got it's got to be really uncomfortable. It's got to be it's got to be yeah. pretty damn tight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So I have this on right now. I'm brought into the emergency department, let's say, because you know I don't think that when you're in the pre-hospital environment, you should really be thinking too much like, ah, do they do that? If you think they need it, you put it on. Agreed. And now I've got somebody, let's see, I've got uh, a couple gunshot wounds mm -hmm. through my forearm. Right. I've got it's fractured. There's no bleeding. Yeah. And I think, okay, well, let me just, I want to take a look and I want to see what's actually going on. Good idea or bad idea? Um, it's going to be a good idea whether if, if he doesn't have major vascular injury, this is purely an orthopedic problem. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a vascular injury, now it's a vascular surgery and orthopedic problem. So I think it is a good idea. However, right now he has no massive hemorrhage. He has no external right. nothing, extremity nothing hemorrhage. Bleeding, yeah. So to figure this out, I'm going to have to release this tourniquet, which means I need to have a plan to control any kind of hemorrhage that may occur. Uh, by definition, all of these commercial tourniquets are one-time items. They're one-time use items. There's fatiguing in the plastic, buckles break. Um, do they really break on the second application? Probably not, but you have to be prepared for that. And typically what happens with these pre-hospital tourniquets uh, is they're converted to a pneumatic tourniquet like most emergency departments have. The downside, of course, is we only have one in our emergency department. You probably only have one in yours, mm -hmm. whereas you can have a boatload of these uh, commercial tourniquets. Okay, so I want to. So if I wanted to take this off and, ex and inspect and see, is this something that where I can I can wait, right. and it's like it's not really bleeding out. Versus, oh, I take this off mm -hmm. and then blood's coming out like crazy. Happens. So what do I do? Sure. So step one, I want to fully expose all of his limb. I want to know that the holes here that got everybody's attention are in fact the only ones I need to deal with. And if I can see the whole limb, that's a good first step. Second step is what is my plan if blood pours out of that. Uh, I'll tell you, and we can show it in Doppler here in a minute, that if I interlace my fingers right on his brachial artery, I can actually completely occlude blood flow to his arm just as well as this tourniquet because of my hand size and his arm size. That was actually, I felt that about half the pressure is this tourniquet. Correct. It's a wider surface area, so it requires less pressure. So I already have a sense that as I release the tourniquet, if blood pours out of it, I could do that. Uh, I probably would also have my pneumatic tourniquet prepped, and I might actually even have it on the limb, just not inflated. What about putting another one of these right below it, 
so that if, yep. if blood comes on, this is a single use, and then Correct. you can just crank it up. It's very reasonable, and in fact, if all of his wounds were down here, but the tourniquet was applied, what's called high and tight, because EMS wasn't sure where the holes were, if there were low, low light uh, situations, there's still an ongoing threat, they'll go as high in the limb as possible. That's exactly what you do. We would put another tourniquet two to three inches proximal from your wounds, below or above or below a joint, and then we'd have that in place if we needed to tourniquet once we released this one. Okay. So either of those would be options, but we're gonna stage another tourniquet, whether that's down on his forearm or below this uh, commercial tourniquet. So if we need it, we have that plan. All right, so then how would, how would you yep. undo this guy? Step one, don't cut it. Now occasionally it's so tight you have to, but if I cut it and I need to use it again, now I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna just basically work backward. Even though it's ostensibly single use. Correct. Like, if you're in a pinch and saw you got, you're, you're gonna use it again. You're gonna apply it again. Yeah. So one sec. So we did. So we've just taken the Velcro retaining band down. We peel off this extra Velcro so we can get to the windlass. And all I need to do is just slowly release this, and then I can just make sure that we can observe the wound and see whether we have significant bleeding. Now, one thing to be aware of is right now. Um, he has arterial flow downstream, but you can tell by his veins here, this, this tourniquet, even with the windlass released, is now a venous constricting band. This is actually a bad stage to be in, because right now arterial flow goes down to your wounds, venous return is impeded. So I actually need to loosen this tourniquet up a little bit so it's not a venous constricting mm -hmm. band. Uh, and then personally, I would just leave it on the limb, because you, you're, you're not planning on using it again, but in an emergency push comes to shove, I can retighten it and then I can see what happens. Other thing we know from the orthopedic surgery literature that you can wear these tourniquets very safely for two hours. Mm -hmm. We know over six hours you start getting issues with compartment syndrome, uh, rhabdomyolysis, um, you know, basically ischemia to the muscles. Where that flex point between uh, two hours and six hours is, we're not really clear on, but up to two hours these have been shown to be very safe. All right, now if people want to get a hold of you, how do they do it? Uh, www.crisis-medicine, the dash is crucial, and that goes directly to my website, uh, my training company, and all of my video materials. All right, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Oh, man, my arm's totally <laughs> numb from that tourniquet. All right, now you know how to put on a tourniquet, and now I know how to put on a tourniquet, and I'll be totally honest, I had never even touched one before. Feeling pretty good about it now. See you later. You made it to the end of the video. Congratulations, well done. You are well on your way to tourniquet awesomeness. We have more coming up. We've got lower extremity tourniquets, abdominal tourniquets, how to pack a gunshot wound. So stay tuned. Actually, depending on when you watch this, that stuff might already be in the sidebar. But before we sign off, I wanted to just go into a little bit more detail on this cat tourniquet. That's the ones that we usually see in our community. Although I, as I said in the video, I had never really fiddled around with one or placed one. I've only done pneumatic tourniquets. But what really struck me was this webbing, this webbing here, that it's not like the windless tourniquets of old where you'd put a strap around somebody's extremity then put a stick through it and then just start spinning that stick. This webbing actually goes through the strap so that when you tighten this windless bar, the strap pulls evenly and so the whole thing constricts. So it acts just like any other tourniquet, but in a totally even fashion. Now, that might have been obvious to you watching this. It wasn't obvious to me until I started saying, oh, how does this thing unravel? And there we go. All right, this is Rob Warman for ERCast signing off. We'll see you next time.